This is Kevin Ring. Welcome to another edition of our Heart to Heart series. Today, we're talking with two incredible advocates, both who were directly impacted by the criminal justice system. And instead of curling, curling up in the fetal position, as we sometimes want to do when things get tough, um, they took matters into their own hands and not only fought for themselves and their loved ones, but for others. And uh, I just think they're both have inspiring stories and we want to share them with you. And so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, it's Ro Cawson and Terry Minor Spencer. Terry uh, is one of our fiercest advocates in Pennsylvania. And Ro, a lot of people know from her advocacy on behalf of her husband, who we're all happy to say, um, just was released from federal prison after a long sentence. And so I want to start both of you just telling a little bit about your story and really how you got impacted by the system, what turned you into an advocate. And Terry, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, so I got involved with the system um, young, early. You know, um, when I got sentenced, I was, um, instead of the judge giving me a rehab, I got sentenced to 16 years in prison. Um, and I was not, at, uh, you know, I, I could not take the drug program there and, get in, and take the advantages of, you know, time off or anything like that. So I went into the drug um, program with, with no strings attached at all. Um, that's where I started learning more about what did minimum mandatory mean? Um, Cause I just didn't, I didn't, I heard it, but I didn't understand it. Um, I started, you know, um, the families that were affected. I was meeting people with, with 100 years and 90 years. And it was just, it was, it was one of the craziest things of, that I've ever encountered. Um, I came home and um, literally, you know, I looked around. And when I looked around, I seen that, you know, um, our community was being uh, treated with lack of because of our ignorance. And what I mean by that is because of our lack of knowledge. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, we had got extremely comfortable. Our, our community had got extremely comfortable with nothing. So um, I decided to, um, everything that, I, that was taught to me, because when I first came home, I was extremely honest with my counselor. I said, hey, I don't know how to do a, a job interview. I don't know how to fill out an application. I don't know none of that. I said, when I went to prison, it was um, beepers. I said, now people's talking to themselves, you know, they got, they got things in their ear. I said, I, so I need help. And um, she sent me to this career development course. So everything that I was taught there, I wanted to give it back and teach our men and women coming home with colorful backgrounds. So I started with that. I um, connected with Pittsburgh Literacy Council, became a certified tutor. I got with two other um, gentlemen in our community and they became certified GED uh, tutors. So we started there, you know, teaching our um, young men and women um, school and getting their GED. Well, let me yeah. ask you first though, when you went to prison, was that, you know, did a lot of people you knew went? I mean, was it, was it, was it strange that you wound up there? What was your life path that, that you know, ended up that way? Yeah, so no, it wasn't strange that I ended up there because of, you know, the, the things that, I'm, the extracurricular activities that I was involved in. So, you know, eventually it was either going to be death, um, incarceration, or I would have um, murdered someone, you know, for the, you know, getting what I wanted or needed. Um, so, but when you say who all went, so yeah, so I went to prison, um, but, you know, I, I don't know if everyone knows that you are, and I hope that no one ex experiences that when you go to prison, the whole family goes to prison. It's not just, you know, the whole, I had a daughter, my daughter, um, my daughter was young, and then my daughter had a daughter, you know, so um, I was in, so, but it's my mom, everybody went to prison, my sisters, my brothers, my uncles, my mom, my, my daughter, um, my granddaughter, everybody went to prison at that time um, in, the, in my whole 16 years. You know, no one, um, no one stops being incarcerated when their loved one is incarcerated, mm. you know? So um, when you say who all went, my whole family went, you know, my yeah. friends went, I had some really close friends that was, you know, rooting for me to not be in the um, extracurricular activities that I were, was in. They were praying for me. They was, you know, hoping that I would, 
you know, wake up one day and say, you know, this is not what I want. Um, but I do remember when I got into the back of the police car, I remember a sigh of like, like just, you know, um, being, being tired of being tired, yeah, yeah. you know, but, um, you know, and I, and I also, you know, I don't want to say, you know, the system, you, because the system works exactly how it's, it's, it was designed to work. It's not that our, my personal opinion is our system is not broken. It is working exactly the way it was designed to work. Um, but I also, you know, I, there was days that I would, um, you know, being thankful that I, at least I'm alive because I started hearing, you know, some of the friends that I was hanging with was, you know, they have OD'd or they have, you know, or worse, you know, um, uh, you know, OD, but may have not have died and, or have died. And, and I would have been there. There's yeah. no question of would I not have been there. I would have been there. So, um, yeah, once I, 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 go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, I mean, I, I met people in federal prison who felt the same way that it was, no one wants to say anything positive about prison, but if they didn't get off the track they were on, yeah, probably headed in the worst direction. And, yeah. And states, I mean, it's, it's, state is like that. I mean, it's just prison is, 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 we're all in it together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, I also know that, you know, I kept like 16 years that you, you judge, think it took me 16 years to, you know, get this. So, um, you know, it's, it's just that, and then I learned a lot in there. I learned um, how to read law, how to read the law books. I learned um, what does um, conspiracy is nine tenths of the law. I learned, so I started listening. And um, when I came home, I literally applied that to, um, to my community, to the community. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, Ro, you are a living example of, when somebody goes to prison, the whole family serves the time. And, you know, tell us about, you know, your family's experience and how you became an advocate. Yeah, so much like Terry, I was faced or what she saw, I mean, inside with these people with these hundreds of year sentences, my loved one was one of those people. He had 213 years. And as anybody who's justice impacted, you know how lonely and isolating this is. And not only is it lonely and isolating, you have people who are at best whispering behind your back, at worst saying the cruelest things to your face. And I felt so ostracized, like nobody understood me. So I went online to search and see what was out there, if anybody could relate to me and what I was feeling and going through. And at that time, there was very little out there. And what was out there was kind of living to this stigma and almost glorifying street life. People just couldn't wait to get their loved ones home so they could hit the street again. And it just fed into that revolving door of respect recidivism. I figured it was kind of twofold. First of all, if it's not out there, I wanted to create it and become that space for people to go to because I knew we could do so much better than that. But second of all, I wanted to do something constructive with this sentence. The system pulled my loved one away from me at that point, potentially for the rest of our lives. I did not want to become bitter. I did not want to let the system win. So that was my way of giving back. That was my way of using this and doing something good with this awful situation that I was faced with. So at that time, I created a blog and a YouTube channel. It was called Strong Prison Wives. And it honestly, I think the need for it was just so great. This was 2009 that it just grew every day. I was getting 500 new people, subscribers, members. By 2015, we incorporated as a nonprofit and it, we added end families because through that, I realized there were so many other people aside for significant others. There were mothers, there were fathers, there were daughters, sons, aunts, uncles, et cetera, that needed this support, that felt that stigma. And that's just how it happened. And it's just grown ever since. Well, that's amazing. Well, listen, I mean, I know your story, of course, and I've been following you, but for people who haven't, I mean, fast forward, he didn't serve 213 years. There's a good He end. did not serve 213 <laughs> years. It's still mind boggling. It's only been two months, but thanks to compassionate release, which was included in the first step act 
and Sean Hopwood, his team, fam, you guys for pushing that story. He was granted his compassionate release and he was released on August 12th of this year. And it's just been a whirlwind ever since, but incredible. I mean, a 200, how, where were you guys in your relationship when he got that sentence? When he got that sentence, we were not in touch. We had lost touch. I was away at school and college and he had been released from his first sentence. He did time in New Jersey state. And during that time, we had no contact. He went back in. So I got back in touch with him in 2009, about nine years into his sentence. And it was, it was just, I didn't want to have a relationship with somebody who was a lifer <laughs> that made no sense to me. It was this wonderful relationship with somebody I could never have, but we just kind of didn't give it a title and we let it go. And I would go visit him and we would chat and we would have visits. And then it grew into something with no expectations. And then it was something I couldn't deny. And we just kind of fought it, but I had to reassess my situation very frequently. Can I keep doing this? Do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to give up on stuff that, a normal outside relationship gets to participate in. And it was just 24 hours at a time. And, and we did it and we pushed and we never gave up hope. We never stopped fighting and we got him home. I mean, did your family think you were crazy? Of course, everybody <laughs> thought I was crazy. <laughs> I, mean, I could relate to that. I could really, really relate to that row because I, I remember when um, the hope is the biggest you know, mm -hmm. is the main part of doing time, you know, um, especially when you're in a room with someone, you're someone's your roommate and they're going home in a month, mm -hmm. you know, um, and you just have to, it, you know, you have to keep that hope. You have to keep hope alive. I remember I would always say, not just myself, but we would literally say back, this was 90, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, nine, literally like this is going to change y'all. This law is going to change. We may not, you know, we may be home by then, but the people that we're leaving here, they're getting out of here. This, this law cannot stay like this, you know, because it's so, it was so racist and so blatantly wrong. Like if anyone with just would just sit down and say, well, wait a minute, well, what are we doing here? How are we fighting this? Uh, war on drugs and you know so I knew that this day that you will be you know saying my husband is home I knew that it will come it was just while you're in there and you're telling people with a 200 year sentence you know you have to keep hope it's going you're getting you're going to get out of here you know so I can really relate to that when you had said you know he kept y'all yeah, you two kept hope it, it's, we a weird, it's a weird thing though, because there's this, you, you're right. I know so many people who had life sentences who are now out and they said, I never thought I was going to serve that life sentence. I just knew something would happen. Yeah. And yet there's a fine line between that, which keeps you alive and then false hope, mm. which can be crushing. Yeah. And so, I mean, how did you deal with that? And by the way, Ro, I just got to say, this is not a normal circumstance. When I got to prison, admittedly a short sentence, it, my second dinner there, you know, all the guys were like, uh, have you got divorced yet? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, that's really cynical. And they're like, ah, it's just a matter of time. And Ooh. it really, that is the gallows humor inside is that it's impossible to even expect your family to wait for you. And that's, it, and I didn't view that as selfish. I viewed it as it's very hard. So I, I just don't know how people do it, but you did it. Well, so I can, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how, if Ro can, if you can um, elaborate on this, but I strongly believe I was doing some like about two or three years ago, I was doing some data on it, but um, women stay. It's the men, the, 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 it's the, the women stay for the man that's in. It's the man that does not stay for the woman that is in. Is that that those are facts. I, I'm gonna want to see your dad on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think as women, we operate on emotion and mm -hmm. so much more than men, and we get stuck in that. And there have been times, admittedly, that I had to show these women the red flags. Mm -hmm. This isn't the best relationship for you. She was so willing right. to stay right. and put up being put up with being controlled from behind mm -hmm. a wall that it works both ways. But speaking to that false yes. hope that you brought up, I found myself 
clinging to sometimes Adam's not necessarily false hope, but his coping was to say things like, I'll be home by this Christmas. And I would, that would be fact in my head. He'll be home by this Christmas. That's what he said. Well, Christmas would come and go. And then it was, I'll be home by your birthday. I'll be home by my birthday. And I would ride those coattails because that would be my hope. And I had to learn throughout the years that was his coping. That was his hope. That's how he got through it. Yeah. I had to detach from that. Literally, I was in the parking lot picking him up with the judge's order, not believing it until he was in my car and we were off wow. the property. Because yes, while I had hope, I had to keep it at arm's length because it was up and down and extremely high and extremely low throughout this whole sentence. Yeah. Well, let me ask you guys about this. So this has been an incredible year because of COVID, because of what's going on with our racial sort of reckoning we're having as a country. Um, I, of those two, it's really more COVID because of what it's doing to the prisons and how nervous everybody is. And then this feeling of helplessness. Um, but working at FAM, I'm reminded that serving others is really gratifying for yourself. Like when you're feeling adrift, helping others is a way to keep yourself, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm doing something useful at a time where everybody else feels I don't know, useless. You both did that. I mean, you both decided, you know, that you wanted to do something that was useful to other people. And so Terry, starting with you, I mean, you talk, you started to talk about, about this, but how did you identify needs? Is it based, was it based on your experience and like what you were seeing in your neighborhood? And then how did you go from, I have an idea to do this to I'm, I'm going to do that? So yeah, good question. Um, wow, Kevin. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'm usually a, um, I'm usually once I get a thought, I move forward with it. Um, so once I found out how that, that secret that, that, that everyone wants to keep away from us, how the, the political arena, that, that ugly little ball works, I, um, I think that I started more or less, because I, I would march on every march. I would march, you know, this is wrong. You know, I have my fist in the air signs. I'm going to DC, I'm going to Harrisburg. I'm marching anything that there's a march, I'm there. Um, you know, I'm our governor. I'm, you know, I'm screaming, I'm writing letters, I'm phone calls, hanging up on them. You know, like I'm hurting their feelings, you know, but um. So that's, that's the thing I miss too with the cell phones because you can't like do that bang, you know, but I would, hey, let's just, so I was an advocate for getting out there. Like, this is wrong. You got to see this is wrong. We're making appointments with senators and governors and state reps and, you know, so what I found, uh, Kevin, is that I, I, one night I said, you know, I have to, we have to tackle the policy. It's the policy that is, you know, because we can stand in the middle. I'm not going to say Fifth Avenue and all that. We can stand in anywhere in the world with a bullhorn hollering and screaming at the people who make these policies. They don't care. They don't care. What they care about is when you come in and affect them. They, you have to, you have to rattle them. You know, so um, once I figured, you know, let's let's start attacking the policy and the legislation, you know, and getting enough people on our side and enough signatures, that's when it was now let's get some um, members to join Western because I have a nonprofit, um, Western Power, and Power is providing opportunities with effective resources, you know, um, and we started as small as, um, Let's just go downtown. Let's talk to the district attorney. Let's just see, you know, let's let's see what policies he follow. You know, um, let's talk to our state reps. Let's talk to our city council. Let's talk to, you know, so I started with that and got with families that were affected. I, I, Ro, if I knew you, I, I'm telling you, you would have been standing right next to me. Like, but I, we started like doing that, Kevin, like getting with families that this has affected. And then um, organizations like FAM, you know, um, sometimes people, even if it's a five minute clip of, hey, how are you and who are you? 
that affects people. It, it literally affects people. It resonates. Um, once we start, once I started telling, like, I'm normal. I'm just like someone in your family. I, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, you know, there's no more shame of being incarcerated because there's one of me in everybody's family. You know what I'm saying? And I'm here to help you understand that when they're real, real quiet or there's a lot of people around and they're not, they're not operating right. It's, it's not you, it's them. They're not, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. you know, I know, I know this one um, young lady that's for about three years coming home, she literally would like just go in the closet. Like she would literally just, there was, and that was her dealing with, there's too many people around. There's too many you know, and, I, and and not knowing you. And, and she did like 28 years. She got like 28 years. And um, she, I mean, you know, but, and, and it's, so yeah, so that's, so Kevin, yeah, I want to go back to the question. So yeah, I started, we started with just attacking the policy um, in, in, in legislation. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yours was, yours was a little different because I don't know if you were based so much on policy as opposed to finding community with other people going through your experience and maybe providing, but maybe I'm wrong about that. But I mean, was that your thinking was there needs to be a community so that other people going through what I'm going through can learn from one another? Absolutely. Yeah. So I didn't have community. I was so ostracized and isolated and Honestly, I'm an Italian girl from New Jersey. I'm not going down without a fight. I was fighting this system that was trying to destroy my life and take my loved one away from me. Uh, and I just kept, it, we just had to keep going and going and going because there wasn't anything out there. And here's a little story. I work in technology and I was very in the closet because like Terry asked me earlier, I was, so, or my family and being around people was just so hard because nobody mm -hmm. understood me and they would say the nastiest things. So I was very quiet. I was so afraid to lose my job. I had been there for so many years that I could take the days off to drive the six hours to go to visit once a month. So, and I needed the money from this job to get me there and to help everybody knows what it's like to fund somebody who's on the inside. So it's quiet. And one day, about nine months into me doing YouTube, that's where I was at that point, one of my coworkers called me and she was a good friend of mine. And she said, hey, people are gossiping about some life or boyfriend or something. And I freaked and I pulled it all down and I started to play small. And then a couple of months later, a friend of mine who was helping me with my marketing, I was getting back into it. He just made it all public, public again. And he said, you have to keep going. And I did some soul searching and this was bigger than me. We yeah. need this so much. So as much as I was doing it, it was kind of doing itself. And throughout that YouTube page and the blog and then the website and the Facebook pages and everything on social media, I met the most incredible people who don't live to the stigma whatsoever. And they started hopping on board and helping me with things that I needed to help me grow. I have no idea about fundraising. I have yes. somebody that would do that. I have no idea about business. I know how to run my mouth on YouTube, but I had somebody hop on and help me with that. And that's how it grew and it developed. And that's how I knew I needed to keep going because it was bigger than me. Yeah. Yeah. And the crazy part is, um, you know, you, you'll never know that when you pulled it all down, how many, how many people were happy to, that they thought they silenced you, you know? So yeah, absolutely. Cause that's, 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 I know when we, when we were marching or we were fighting and, and I know that it worked, you know, I know our fighting was working everything because we literally was watching the people that was my roommates and like they were eating lunch with Barack Obama and, and he was like, oh my God, he's there. Watch, he's literally letting them out, you know? Um, so it worked and, and I, I just know that how many people was, was happy thinking they silenced you when you took it down. Well, Absolutely. And you know, okay. like you said earlier, you're one of them through eventually coming out. I realized how much I was one of them. People would come to me on the side and be like, my son's incarcerated. Yeah. My nephew's incarcerated. Yeah. And all of us, it's almost like we hide alone. Mm -hmm. We wear these invisible shackles as we call them on strong prison wives and families as family members, or even people who are formerly incarcerated. And it's up to people like us to break that stigma. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, and I'm, I know Kevin, you gotta say something, but I'm so no, glad no, you no, said no. that because Ro, it's like they do, they want us to be quiet and like, you shouldn't say that, you shouldn't. I, I literally, someone was like, well, you shouldn't say that. Listen, you gotta kick in doors. This is who I am. This is where I'm coming from it, but this is where I'm going. And it's one of me and all of our family. You may not want to talk about Uncle Timmy or little sis Sharon or, but it's one of me and everybody's family, you know, so. Yeah, well, well, I mean, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that. We always say that, that if if people would just speak out and Ro, I had a similar experience after the FBI raided my house, which was very shame, you know, shaming experience and all the rest. I had neighbors coming up to me one by one the next couple of weeks saying, hey, I've never told anybody, but my brother went to prison. And, yeah. and I'm like, well, why aren't we talking about this? We know the stats are that so many people do it. I don't know how to tell people, you know, cause this is their life. And I, I'm, especially being white, I have it a little easier. There's not the same stigma. Yeah. It surprises people, but I don't play into a stereotype of this guy is, oh yeah, he's trouble or whatever. It was more shock. And so that's why I talk about it more, I think than most people. But for some people, it is a source of shame in their family or with their coworkers. And I don't know if there's an easy way, like, you know, you, we all may not be illustrative because you, you guys are two street fighters and, and I'm a loud mouth. And so it, <laughs> we're gonna talk about this stuff just to live. But I mean, I do think there's value in saying to other people, I look at the gay rights movement. I always say this, I mean, I grew up in the seventies and you would, I, you know, if you had asked me 20 years ago, I would have said, oh yeah, no one was gay when I was a kid. Well, of course <laughs> they were, uh, they, no one said it. And, 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 you know, we know that one out of two adults, you know, has a family member, immediate family member who spent some time in prison or jail. So we have the built-in army, but we're still stigmatized. So we don't talk about it. I mean, how can people get out of that? I would love to respond to that. I took a grief and coping class specifically for prison wives a few years back that Dr. Avon Hart Johnson put on. And she taught us in that class, the three E's as she called it. So if you're one of those people who does feel like you don't want to share and you're suffering in silence, there are three times that you want to share. If you are educating somebody, if you're empathizing with somebody, or if you're empowering somebody. And then the other times, you don't have to feel obligated to share. You can stay silent. You can go on with your life. But if you're using it for those three reasons, then it's perfectly fine to share. And we all have our own journey. We all walk in this. There's no right or wrong way to navigate incarceration. It's just not normal. So whatever works for you is beautiful. But my loved one suggested one time because I was genuinely suffering in silence. And he said, why don't you just pick one person you trust and share it with them and see how they react. And I was petrified, but I finally did. I had made really good friends with this girl from the gym and we wound up working together for six years before that. We had no idea we worked on different floors of the same building. Anyway, after a couple of months of kind of trying to work up the nerve, I shared it with her. She was so supportive because just like Terry said before, and like I said earlier, We are one in four, one in four women is directly impacted by incarceration. It's a lot more than you think. So just try, slowly try to break it to people if you want to. And and, and yeah, the piggyback off a row, um, you know, I know I was talking to a young lady um, and um, we had, we had started talking because of death. There was death in my family, was death in our family. And we were, um, we were at this, uh, like this event and we started just, we was at lunch and we started collaborating. And um, long story short, she had someone that was incarcerated and she, um, she didn't tell me, she, she would not tell people. And to, to get to the bottom of it, it was that it was her shame. Like she failed. And, um, and she said, that's what a lot of people, and she was a white lady. And she said, that's what a lot of people that she knows that they feel like, you know, I failed. I failed as a father. I failed as a mom. I failed as an aunt. And literally I was, you know, I, this ain't about you. This has nothing to do with you. You know, so, I mean, and I was basically like, you're being kind of selfish that making this thing of that someone's incarcerated about you. It has nothing to do with me. You know, and if you move yourself out of the way of understanding the person that's incarcerated, you'll understand more. And literally we still talk now. She was like, thank you. You know, yeah, she said, nobody ever put it to me like that. Like, yeah, this has nothing to do with you, ma'am. 
Thank yeah, you. I've noticed when we've done some social media campaigns and we've asked people to share things on their Facebook page, you know, that's, they're fine sharing in our group, but they don't share it on their personal page because they have family and loved ones who don't know. And so I wow. see that. I'll tell you, the flip side of it is the first time you guys know Sean Hopwood, who's on our board, Georgetown Law Professor, worked on, you know, served time and worked on um, Adam Rose Husband's case. First time we finally got to meet, I got out of prison. I was taking over FAM and we were sitting at lunch. And, you know, he said, oh, I'm going to be on FAM's board. I said, great. And this waiter came up and he said, were you guys talking about prison? And, you know, I just thought for a, I, I just waited for a second. Sean said, oh, yeah, he went to prison for bribing politicians and I robbed banks. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy just started laughing. He's like, oh, that's so great that you guys can talk about it. But I've noticed even if I have young daughters, it is liberating to get that off you my daughter yeah. what my older daughter did not tell anyone and then last year for she was the editor of her school paper she wrote an op-ed it was a you know a valentine's day issue and she wrote about the bond that she had with me while i was in prison and it was the same experience all she got was hugs from teachers other students who came up to her and said you know oh I, yeah one either that was brave of you or i have the love i have a family member who's in prison and it's just changed her life not to have to live. It's like being a liar, like living with a lie that you've told. This is such an important part of your life that you can't share with others. Yeah. And so it is such a burden if you can put it down. Yeah. And I think, Rose, I think you can um, elaborate on this as well. You know, I think that also people will also find that once you open up and like, this is, this is who I am. I mean, you, you, you become a family. Like you be, you have a family that, it's just never going nowhere. You know what I mean? You just, you have a family and you, and the best thing is you have a family that understands, you know, that knows um, exactly what you're going through or know how you feel. Or I know when I first came home, the weirdest thing for me was um, the streetlights, the red, yellow, and green. Oh my God. They used to, it felt like they were sucking me in. Like I was, it's the crazy, like, it's so crazy. So if I was sitting in the passenger seat and I could see one coming, I would like, I would act like I'm getting something from the back because it that they they just they look they felt so huge and they were like sucking me in if I looked at it. So and um cars like cars if cars was coming next to me and they were like real slow, I would panic because you don't you ain't seen a car. You see a car at 60, you haven't, heard a, you haven't heard a horn, you haven't, you know, so that, them little things used to, yeah, they used, it, 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 it used to trick me so much, I had to tell my counselor, like, I need, I need a therapist, you well, know, let me because. Ask you this. You, you, there's a question that came in for you, um, Terry, and I wonder about this, you uh, as well, is like, some of this is just your personality. I can imagine you were a ball of fire, even when you were doing bad things. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know what what changed for you when did the light bulb go off and you and you know i, I know prison didn't help but you, you probably just grew up a little bit and needed to just you know so what, what but was there a light bulb that went off or what happened yeah it was so um what happened for me the um thank you for that question what happened for me what changed me was um you know when you when i first went in it was almost as easy as getting high as it was on the street. Um, the, the officers would bring it in, the guards would bring it in. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was really easy. It was really easy. One, one morning, you wasn't allowed to smoke in the, in the units. And so one morning, which we did, one morning um, you go into the laundry room, you smoke a cigarette. Um, so I was going into the laundry room. I was, I was, little over a year in, I was little over a year in, maybe two, and um, still getting high, still um, uh, just feeling yucky. And um, I walked into the laundry room and there was, Miss, there was a, a guard and he was with a young woman and she was giving him oral sex. And I knew she got high because we used to get high together. And I remember him saying, Terry, close the door, close the door. Because I stood, I was stuck. I was just, I knew that it happened. I knew that it always, but I now I'm witnessing it. And I was, I was froze. And he, 
screaming like, close the door, close the door. So I closed the door and I went back to my room. Um, I didn't get to smoke the cigarette. Um, I, so I, the very next morning, I went to, I laid down. I don't know how much sleep I got, but I knew that next morning when I woke up, I knew that eventually this is ready to be me. This is ready to be me to get high. Um, I went to my counselor, Mr. Troutman. I went to Mr. Troutman. I said, Mr. Troutman, I need the drug program. And he looked at me because I'm in, you know what I'm saying? So he's like, you need, I said, I need the drug program. I need the drug program today. That evening after dinner, they sent me to the drug program. So I stayed there. The drug program there was you could not watch TV. You could not be on the phone. You could not. It was, this, uh, uh, but um, it was a nine month program. When the nine months was over, and it's like, say if you're the, the, the jail is here, and the program was like two, three miles away, but it's still on the jail, you know, I'm still on the prison, uh, but you don't see nobody, you don't, um, you know, you don't correspond with nobody, um, you watch TV, you watch news one hour a day, that's it, that's it, um, and the nine months came, and I said to my counselor, I said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to go down. I did another nine months. And um, when on my eighth month, I asked to be transferred. They transferred me. And that's, it was just a new, I liked the way I felt. I liked the way I looked. I liked the way I was thinking. I liked the way that I can correspond with people. And, and I never turned back around. Let me ask you a quick question about this. Because I, I think a lot of criminal behavior is criminal thinking. There is a criminal mindset. Mm -hmm. that people who take risks that others don't, I mean, this is, you know, sort of been studied and proven. Do you, do you recognize that old person? Do, do you know who you were before? And you say, oh, I, I know what I would have done in that position when I was that age. Are you, are you the same? Do you see a difference? Like, how do you, how do you look yeah. back at the way you acted then and say, oh no, I, I'm definitely different, but I, but I have pieces of me that are that. What yeah. yeah, I have pieces that are, so my, the pieces that I have is that, um, yeah, so uh, I don't, I don't fight no more. I'm kind of old, too old for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't fight anymore, but I am, what, what I bought with me is Kevin, I, um, I am extremely unapologetic about, you know, um, yeah, I'm unapologetic. Hey, you, you don't know? have to tell me that. I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, I bought that with me, and I bought that. You know, the the same way that that energy and that that um, determination that I took to get high, I now use that determination, that energy to um, change policy, change legislation. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to talk too much about you know political because right. it's non you know uh, nonpartisan. But um, yeah, so I use that energy to let them know. I can still let any elected official know that um, I'm extremely unapologetic, and either you're going to we're either going to discuss how to change this, or you're going to be replaced. Well, so. no, let me just say this: we're nonpartisan, but. 100% we're getting close to an election and we always say to people either you change the law or we're going to change the lawmaker. We, that's it. Yeah. That's that, so like, that's that's the bottom line. We'll you work know, with so, you if you work with us and if yeah. you don't I don't care if you have an R or D or whatever you are. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um and so yeah, so that's what I use that same energy um and I and, and as you said um, earlier when you were saying, you know, while I was getting high, I was one of the ones that you know, if I had, uh, my drug of choice was crack cocaine. So, and if I had a, um, if I had a 20, you know, and I see you, I'll split it. You know, um, that was me. You know what I mean? Um, so I try to bring that same care and, and, and compassion and um, everything I do learn, I tell somebody else. I don't hold yeah, nothing. I, I don't hold nothing to myself. I try to um, empty myself of anything that I know um, and then get filled up back up with more. You know what I'm saying? Like, Ro, yeah. I'll probably be telling people, listen, I know, I got a friend. She has this organization. So yeah, so that's that's just me. You know, I tried to, um, and I bought that back with me and I, um, I'm not a, I wasn't, 
I was so as I was getting high, I was um I I had my days that I was ashamed of that I didn't go to the family Thanksgiving or something like that. I was a dressed up garbage can. You know, I was a dressed up garbage can. Um, and so I was unapologetic about till my daughter. Once I had my daughter, it was like, nah, oh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know. So I can't say that I was sorry then because I didn't know the pain that I was giving to my family. You know what I'm saying? They never came and said, you're hurting me. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know until I was in prison. So while I was in my, um, while I was in my days and years and months of, you know, um, that all that rhetoric, I didn't know that my mom was staying up night after night after night. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know until right. I was, until I was laying down and had nothing else to do but think and hear, you know? Yeah. Well, Ver, let me ask you this because you, you have a different experience being on the outside. I mean, how, not, I mean, how, not political, but I mean, did you get, did you start thinking we got to change policy? I mean, how did you move to that angle or was it more, you know, sort of services and community building or did you start thinking, okay, we got to, we got to make changes? Mine was originally community building and then selfishly kind of, I was trying to change 924C, the law my yeah. loved one was sentenced under. Yeah. Uh, the way that my 501c3 works, I don't have that extra piece for lobbying and advocacy and whatever that is to change law. I encourage the people that are a part of my community to go out and to get involved with whatever hits close to home and hits their heart. I kind of stayed away from policy. My advocacy genuinely starts with I need to help advocate for you to get out of bed in the morning when your loved one is ripped out of the house and you had no idea this was going on, or you have no idea how to pay the mortgage, or you have no idea how you're going to keep the roof over the head or feed your children. So that's where it was for me. Eventually, I would love to get into that. But right now, up until today, it's just been mostly that community building. No, and that's, it's, yeah. it, you know, we're, we're a policy advocacy group, but you know, we deal with directly impacted family members and you know part of our facebook group is to create that community because people do have those questions those are the day-to-day -day things that people and you know we're not direct services and all we can do is try to you know shepherd people to folks like you who know more about you know who have had those experiences because most experiences are not unique i mean people are going through the same thing and to that end let me ask you this i asked you a little bit before but i know people will be interested is now he's home. It's only been two months, but how how is that? Because there's probably all this anticipation, and then is it is it everything you hope for? Is it somewhere you know? Is it like a letdown? No, that's not. It. It's not a letdown <laughs> whatsoever. It's everything we hope for, and we were very conscious of being first of all communicating through everything: the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs, everything, open and honest, complete transparency. Number one, number two despite him being a lifer, we were always laser focused on what we would do when he was awarded yeah. his release, not knowing when that would be or how he would get there, knowing it would happen. So we had a plan. I picked him up and we drove across the country and we moved to Las Vegas and we're working with Hope for Prisoners, a job that he had lined up years prior to him being released. So I think that's where it was a little bit easier for us. Now there have been the unfortunate situations where prior to this, I used to judge people. How dare you get out and get a second chance that I may never get and go back in. But now, honestly, I can empathize things like not having ID. So at the prison where he was, they threw away out of spite his social security card and his birth certificate. So for yeah. him to get his driver's license, he needs a social security card, but he can't get a social security card without other ID. He can't get a bank account without that. How are you going to get a job? Thank God he has one. How are you going to get a job without a bank account? So it's this vicious cycle where we're very, very fortunate that we're working so close with John Ponder, he could pick up the phone and make phone calls for us and he can help us. And we're very blessed in that aspect. What about the people that don't have that? And that's where right now I'm trying to focus on helping people because that, that was our struggle. But thankfully we had people in the places that could help us not struggle as much as I know so many people out there are struggling when they're coming home. But other than those minor hiccups, it's been wonderful. That's awesome. Let me ask you a question. I thought your three E's were 
that was so good. And we're going to have to have a show where we come back and just talk about self-care and yeah. because that is the trick for people and, and maybe close because we're getting to the holidays and I'm sure that that's a tough time. But along those lines, let me ask you, like, how do you manage? I mean, some of us are not great at balance, right? Like I'm good at 100% this or 100% that. So like to be an advocate, but then also you have to be present for your family that you're with or your job or the other things. So how do you compartmentalize? You know, like I'm doing everything I can for you and maybe he's having a down day and he's calling you and saying, what's going on and what are you doing? And you're like, I'm just trying to keep me afloat. Like, how do you compartmentalize? I guess, because I, I think, I remember when I was going to see a therapist and I'm like, oh, I feel like compartmentalizing. She goes, that's a great technique. That's not, don't say that pejoratively. If you can do that, you want to do that because otherwise, you know, you'll eat yourself up. But is that what you did or how did you, how did you balance the two? Yeah. You said the perfect catchphrase self-care. So, so many of us that find ourselves in these relationships are givers and fixers and we neglect ourselves often, but it's that age old overused cliche of putting your oxygen mask on first. So my advice is always, you have to find your thing. What do you do? For me, it was working out, eating healthy. I knew that I needed that to stay in balance, working out, eating healthy and getting enough sleep. So I oh my had goodness. to prioritize you got good habits. <laughs> I had to prioritize that because there were days that I did not want to get out of bed. There were days when his clemency petition was, it was the last day it was over. We thought he was getting it. I would just spontaneously break out in tears in my desk at work, at the doctor's office, you name it, I would do it. Who wants to work out when you're feeling like that? But those were the habits that I needed to do. I couldn't think about it. I had to put on my shoes. I had to go for a run because I knew that I would feel better. I'm not saying everybody's thing needs to be that, but what is your thing? Do you like to journal? Yeah. Do you like to dance? Do you need to just get on the phone with a friend and vent it out? Whatever that is, whatever that looks like for you, you need to prioritize that. The other thing that I always preach because it worked beautifully for me is 24 hours. That is all you get to sit around, to mope, to lay yeah. in bed, to eat Doritos, to not want <laughs> to not want to go into work. Then you have to, Th that doesn't mean that everything's going to lift and be glamorous the next day, but you have to start living life again. You have to go back to work. You have to take care of your babies. You have to do yeah. the run that you don't want to do. Otherwise you're just going to fall deeper and deeper and deeper, and you're not going to be able to dig yourself out of a depression. So those were really the two main things that really helped me stay in balance. It's not always easy, but you know what? There might be times where you're arguing and you don't want to pick up the phone and that's okay. Yeah, it, yeah. You don't stop, drop and do everything for your loved one who's inside at all times. If it means neglecting yourself, it's a hard yeah. pill to swallow, especially if you're that fixer, but you just have to do that because you need to be there. You need to be healthy to take care of everybody else. Well, Terry, I'm an, I want to ask you Terry, because I like when people say this, because when I was in, I did not want people worrying about me. So a lot of times the advice I'm giving to people, like when we're talking at fam and stuff is to say, live your life. I mean, the word, the last thing the person inside wants to know is that, you know, you're bringing them down on the outside. Yeah. You're already feeling bad enough that you're in. You don't want them moping around and being miserable. Was the, I mean, is that how you felt? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, um, you know what, I was fortunate enough though. Um, I have to say I was literally fortunate enough to the women that I was incarcerated with phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if, if one was hurt, we all was hurt, yeah. you know, um, if one was up, we all was up, you know, if one's family member was having a baby or, you know, so I was blessed. I was really, really blessed and fortunate to, for the women that I was incarcerated with. Um, and yeah, I would, um, if I was not feeling positive and upbeat and I wouldn't call home. I, I was not, I was not one of the ones I'm calling home to feel better. You know, I'm, I'm calling home so you can make me feel better. No, I, you know, I, um, I, I tried to take them 15 minutes and use, utilize them to the best of letting them know I'm okay. Um, you know, so yeah, I did not use that, that, um, I did not use to call home to, um, you know, to get them depressed. I yeah. used the people, um, that was around me 
that was um, that knew exactly, you know, my body language, my um, and can give me feedback right there, you know, and um, then we can, you know, work through it throughout that day. So yeah, I did not. I always, I always, um, yeah, my family could tell you I never called home with, you know, I'm going through this or I'm going through that or or something like that. No. Um, one thing you guys mentioned earlier, and I want to give you another chance to do, can you both sort of plug the groups that you're, I mean, I know, Terry, you're local in Pittsburgh, um, but can you, and then Ro with uh, Strong Prison Wives, now, and, and you're going to continue advocating, yes, Ro? Yep. Uh, no one would blame you if you had done enough, but that's good of you. Um, can you just sort of talk a little bit about your organizations and if people are interested, you know, what you, yeah. what you do? So yeah, so Western Power is um, a grassroots nonprofit organization um, and we fight. So right now we do a educational community civic series. And what that consists of is we go around Pittsburgh and to various communities to um, you know, make sure that our communities know that, <clears throat> excuse me, the presidential election is not the most important election in our lives. You know, local offices affect our lives 365 days a year. And so we teach from all the way from the chair ward up into the governor, the mayor. <clears throat> we teach our community that in Allegheny County to become a magistrate, you just need a GED. That's it. The classes are free. You know, so that's how you dismantle that um, blight, the, the houses that the slum landlord uh, don't want to, you know, fix up the houses and then the magistrate sides with him because, or her, because the landlord have gave a $10,000 deposit to their campaign. So, you know, we teach the whole thing of this is how this process works. This is how your side, this is the office that does your sidewalks, your streets, your stop signs, your, um, and make sure that we empower ourselves not to continue to be treated less than because of our zip code, you know? And that's what, um, that's a, what, like I said at the very beginning, our family, have, our communities have became comfortable with nothing. You know, we don't want, we don't want, we don't need a whole bunch of pictures. We don't need, we don't need no chicken pizzas. We don't need none of them parties. We need some policy change and we need some leg legislation change. Um, Rick, <clears throat> so <clears throat> Western Power has taken up that, um, that, that challenge. Um, we work with the organization uh, BPEP. BPEP makes sure that um, BPEP is the Black Political Empowerment Project. They make sure that every single Black person vote. Um, we, we coordinate with 1PA. 1PA talks about, um, they advocate for schools, uh, prison to pipeline, uh, housing, um, uh, anything that there is to fight for, 1PA is fighting for. So we collaborate with a lot of organizations in Pittsburgh. Um, one thing that I like to say about West Empower is we do not stay in one, one box. We like to co uh, collaborate with various organizations because we strongly believe there is power in numbers. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's West Empower. Uh, yeah, call. 412-620-3833 if you want to volunteer or anything like that. Yeah. Good. Bro, tell us about Strong Prison Wives. Yeah. So Strong Prison Wives and Families, we help encourage, empower, support loved ones of the incarcerated. We provide resources. We are everywhere on social media at Strong Prison Wives. Our website is strongprisonwivesandfamilies.com. Also, I have a YouTube channel. It's Roe and Adam Clausen. I think we're about 19,000 subscribers right now. We have a goal to reach 20,000 in 2020. So subscribe. Um, <laughs> and that's it. And you know, you said earlier how you understand if people have to get out and move on. And I've always said that as well. And I heard somebody say this the other day. He said he got out of prison and he felt like he got out of a burning building and he needed to go back and save the people that were stuck mm -hmm. in the building. And I kind of feel obligated to do the same thing. I got him out of the burning building. Mm -hmm. Now I'm coming for my sisters and my brothers. Yeah, yes. no, that's great. Yeah. I know a lot of people feel that when they come down, I just always think, I think in the same way that there's, trauma that comes with yeah. the prison experience 
And so there's times where, you know, I, I wish everybody had that attitude. There's times where I also feel like I don't blame people for saying, I got to reclaim what I have left of my life that I just took yeah. away all this time from my family. Mm. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go be a cog in a machine and I'm never going to talk about this. I get that too. Absolutely. Um, but I think there's enough people now coming out saying, we got to fix what I was in there for. And, I, and, and so many people I know, like I was in for a white collar offense. I didn't come out thinking we got to fix white collar sentences. I think they're crazy too. But you see the drug sentences, you see the gun sentences, you see the mess and you say, look, I, it's not about me. I, I, I'm out. I, I'm, I'm Ben, you know, I'm fortunate. Um, all right. We're about to wrap up. Any uh, last words, any piece of advice? I do think we should do another show at some point was we get closer to the holidays about self-care um, because I just know, especially because COVID has been so tough. Yeah, um, yeah. It's been in a level of anxiety that, you know, I haven't seen doing this work. Um, but before we close, anything, anybody you, you all want to share? I mean, awesome. I knew it would be easy to talk to you both. Ro, I can't believe we hadn't met before this. So I'm grateful to finally meet you. I've heard about yours and Adam's story and so impressed with what you've done. And of course- I was thinking the same thing. Like, how don't I know her? You know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yes, I wrote it down. I will be sub sub subscribing. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Anything else you guys want to share? We're, otherwise, we're going to sign off. No, thank um, you so much for inviting me to the conversation. You guys are wonderful. Love sharing the story. And I appreciate everything, all the kind words and everything Sam and Sean Hopwood specifically and his team did for my family. Yeah, yeah. no, no doubt. Sean's the best. Yeah, Gary? as always. Hey, thank you. Um, you know, Always, I'm there for fam. Um, I love fam. Uh, I can't, I just do want to say, I want to piggyback off of what Rose said. You know, after 24 hours, we have to pick ourselves up, pick your chin up, straighten your back and keep it moving, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, all right. Well, you guys are the best. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. Oh, I actually have a little promo I can do, like I'm on some talk show. <laughs> Next week, Brittany Barnett. Uh, the uh, founder of Buried Alive Project uh, has a best-selling book called A Knock at Midnight. And so her story is incredible. Brittany uh, was directly impacted. Her mother was in prison. And now she's a lawyer, uh, African-American woman who just really is an amazing story. And now her Buried Alive Project is getting people out of prison who are serving life sentences, usually for drugs. And um, just, she's got like, a two-man band and uh, just incredible advocates. So we'll be excited to talk about her book. If you don't have it, think about getting it before next week so we can talk about it. Uh, but again, thanks to Ro and to Terry and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting y'all. Yeah. Likewise.